the goal against Sunderland was, I mean, I think you could see in my celebration because I was in so much shock, I didn't know what to do. And it was my friends and family laughed about how bad the celebration was, but I was in, in real shock. Hey guys, it's producer Ross here and welcome back to another edition of Ross Meets, the series where I catch up with former town players to talk about their careers from the ups to the downs and everything in between. And here we go, the 11th edition of the series so far. I want to say a big thank you to everybody who has listened to the previous episode. It's been a pleasure to bring these guys. I hope you enjoyed them and I hope you enjoyed today's episode, which is with former town defender, Titus Bramble, and what a pleasure it was to chat to Titus about his time at Portland Road and his career as a whole. Of course, he had other spells at Newcastle, Wigan and Sunderland, but it was great chatting to him about his time at Portman Road from his debut season playing in the Premier League. And of course, we had a very successful season that year, finishing fifth in the Premier League, uh, our first season back in the top flight, and he chatted about that in depth. Of course, his goal against Sunderland, which he was very shocked about, as you can see in his celebration, but it was great chatting to him about that. And that season as a whole, players that helped him, George Burley, just different moments during that season. Then, of course, then the second season where we had a bit of a European tour, which also we suffered relegation from the Premier League. But um, he chatted very much in depth about his time experiencing playing in Europe for the first time, especially then two games in Inter Milan, the 1-0 win, then the 4-1 defeat at the San Siro. But he chatted about playing against them sort of players and the likes of Zanetti, uh, Seedolf, uh, Ronaldo, of course. He's actually got Ronaldo's shirt and a nice little story about that. But it was great chatting to Tyus about his two seasons at Portman Road. And um, then we went on to talk about his time at his other clubs from Newcastle under Sir Bobby, Graham Sunez, Glenn Roder. Then also his spell at Wigan under Steve Bruce, Roberto Martinez, then also Sunderland, where he reunited with Steve Bruce and just chatted about his career as a whole. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. I'm rambling as I normally do. Uh, he also mentioned about his uh, charity work with Future Stars, with Simon Milton, and his time as a coach at Portman Road. But yep, let's get right into this, guys. I'm rambling as I normally do. I know you want to listen to it. I do as well. So let's get right into this interview. Hope you enjoy it. Let's go. Hey Titus, how are you? I'm not bad, thanks, are you? Yeah, all well, good, uh, coping in this current situation, how, how are you getting on? Yeah, very well, um, lots of cycling, yeah. lots of in the garden, lots of golf, yeah, so nice. it's, it's uh, all good. Yeah, luckily, uh, you know, the sunshine's been out, I think if this was uh, in November time, all doom and gloom, I think, yeah, it wouldn't be as as good, would it? Yeah, no, it'd be uh, very different and people's moods would be very different yeah. and not so upbeat and positive. Yeah. So um, how I start these podcasts is basically starting from the beginning of Titus Bramble. So, you know, did you always want to play football, you know, as a kid and stuff like that? Yeah, um, I had an older brother mm-hmm. um, and I had family members that were play football locally. So it's always, I've always been kind of football with them and kind of that's what's my first love then um when do you feel you wanted to progress to become a professional footballer you know what did you know was it your first sort of team or did you play locally in itchwich because you're of course born and bred in itchwich and stuff yeah i played for the school team um i think like most kids you you kind of dream of being a professional footballer but don't really think it's going to happen uh especially at uh, such a young age um it's not until you get to an older age where you kind of think there's could be a small possibility that it, you could live the dream but um yeah i played for a local team called uh Kesgrave kestrels um and ica which is the british caribbean association so they were my two first teams and obviously the school team before i got kind of got a chance rip switch and yeah you played then you're at itch which for youth team and who was sort of in your age you know range there of course kieran was jumping you know a few years older than you but who was sort of coming through at the same time as you yeah, so Kieran was, was two years two years older than me. Um, so the only person to kind of play in the first team in my youth team was Richard, Richard Logan. Oh yeah, yeah. He played a few games for the first team and then obviously went went down the league. Didn't really have much of a, a, a career at pitch. Yeah, of course. George Burley, of course, was your manager. What was he like as a as a gaffer? Yeah, no. George was 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 massive for me um, in my early years. Um, just because he, he 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 was doing things now that obviously twenty years ago that was kind of unheard of, um, and nowadays it's it's kind of 
quite big in football, um, as in like he was getting me to do Pilates, he was getting me to see a sports psychologist and at the time being a young kid I kind of frowned upon it because I thought I don't need a psychologist, I don't need to do Pilates but um, obviously didn't realise the importance of it and like I said nowadays it's, it's a massive thing in football. Who was um, you know, the senior players who sort of helped you, you know, when you were coming through, you know, you made your debut in the 98-99 season, you you know, you started against Sheffield United in that 2-1 win, so who, who helped you sort of, you know, just put an arm around your shoulder and say, come on lad, let's let's get it? Well, obviously, I, I've known Kieran growing up, I knew Richard Wright growing up as well, so they were, were really big and um, kind of calming my nerves and stuff, but Tony Mowbray was probably the biggest influence as a player on my career. Um, well, he, he, used to talk, he, was, he was a great talker, a great leader, and... Um, he would talk me through the games because obviously when Tony later on in his, his career he didn't have the legs he wasn't yeah. as quick as he was yeah. he once was so he had younger players like me to, to kind of not do his run of him but he could put us into positions where he wouldn't have to run as much what's your, what's your memories from that your debut you know 17 years old going going to Sheffield United you know they're, they're a big team you know any memories from that yeah I mean that was quite funny because it was like a um, for a few years before then me and Kieran had, had, had been having a little run and joke about who would make their debut first um, Kieran made his debut as a first year scholar um, on his on Boxing Day and I beat him by six days so um, I was buzzing with that to be fair but yeah I just remember uh, the day it was, it was I got told um, the night before I was, I was making my debut and kind of got butterflies and nerves and all sorts um, but then on the day as as, as you kind of start the game it's just a normal game you realise it's just 11 v 11 and you don't really think anything of it yeah. yeah I think you you know you went on to make five appearances that season did George sort of tell you you know you're going to be in and out and then of course the following season of course was a very successful season you didn't play any part of it but um, did George sort of say you know you'll you'll get your chance no, it's not. It's not a case of just George trying to get the. I, I think it's, it's like anything. I mean, um, George was was one of their managers that if you're if you're young enough, or if you're yeah, if you're if you're young enough, you're old enough. You kind of you, your age age was was nothing. Um, yeah, George would, would put you in if you had the, the ability. He was wasn't afraid to put kids in. That's how he's always been over his managerial career. You were the course. There at Wembley, you know, you're on the pitch, you're also on the open top bus, you know, what's your memories of that as a you know, a young lad, a Itchwich born lad as well, so that must have been great for you. Yeah, it was fantastic, but I mean, as a player, it was kind of, I mean, I, I think I've said this before in the interview, but I was kind of a bit in in two minds as selfishly if I wanted us to go up, because in my head I thought, if we get to the Premiership, we're going to buy yeah. more, more players coming, so I'm going to get, I won't get much of a chance, so... <laughs> In my head, I was thinking, do we want to go up? Do I want the club, to, the, the team to go up? So selfishly, it was a, was a no, but obviously, um, as a fan and, and being in the area, it was, it was a big yes. And obviously, once we got promoted and I then fired, fired games, it was it was kind of, it was great. Yeah. Did George sort of tell you that you were going to be a, a starter in the Premier League? You know, you were, I think, 18 or 19 at that, that, that point, you know, or maybe turn 20. You know, did George sort of sit you down and say, "Yep, yeah, I'm gonna gonna make you as one of my starters for the Premier League"? No, I think uh, yeah. I came back to pre-season as, as normal and had a, had a really good pre-season. Um, and then, obviously, being in around the first team, you start some games, and as as a young kid, you just want to impress them games. And uh, I must have done enough to to for him to start me at, uh, first game of the season. But it wasn't. I didn't. He, he definitely, definitely pulled me to a side and say, "Look." You're you're gonna start. It's, everyone has a kind of everyone has a chance to prove themselves. Yeah, you must have been on cloud nine at that point. You know, playing in the top flight of English football, the first two games, of course, Tottenham Man United, and then your third appearance, scoring. I've I've you know rewatched it. Loads of fans have. When it's hits that day against Sunderland, we watched the goal back, and what a goal that was. You know, what's your memories of that? I'm sure you've watched about a few times. Yeah, I've seen it, seen it a few times, but um, it, it, listen, it's, a, it's a cliche and it sounds a bit corny. But I said I was, I was being a Lipswich fan. I, it was like it was a dream come true. Even the first game of the season against Tottenham, playing for your boyhood club in the Premier League, it is what dreams are made of. Um, and then second, like you said, the second game against Man United is one of the biggest clubs in the world. So first game in the Premiership of Portman Road, um, it was it was fantastic. And then the third game, the goal against Sunderland was. I mean, 
I'm thinking you could see in my celebration because I was in so much shock. I didn't know what to do. It, it was my friends and family laugh about how bad the celebration was, but I was in in real shock. You know that season was so successful. You know we finished fifth. You know what for you? What did you feel was the sort of secret ingredient, or why did you think we were so successful that season? Because of the players we had. You know Marcus Stewart scored all those goals. You know, but for yourself at the back, you know what what did you just feel that season was so special. I just think that as a squad, we had we had a, a great togetherness and great belief throughout the squad and coming from the manager. So um, we kind of, like I said, no one expects us to do what we expect us to do so well. F1, he thought we'll walk up and get, go straight back down. So um, it was good that George kept this style of play and didn't change his style of play because as, as players, that's all we know. And um, teams, when we went to teams and... and kept our style of play didn't put 11 men behind the ball they were kind of taken aback and obviously we got results and it kind of winning a couple of games early on and it just breeds confidence and that carried on for the whole season yeah. of course you know it's well known that you and Kieran are good friends of course he left the season before we got promoted so, you know did you guys sort of have a little joke about you know, now you're playing in the Premier League for Richard Town and of course he's at Newcastle and doing really well there but he must have gone oh, he probably has said that oh you know I missed the opportunity to play for my boyhood club in the Premier League, but it's just one of those things in football, isn't it? Yeah, it is one of the things. I mean, like I said, he, he failed in a couple of playoffs, so that's, yeah. again, that's a little bit of a running joke that he, <laughs> he couldn't get through the playoffs. But, I mean, like I said, I wasn't involved, but I didn't play in the playoffs, but I was part of the team, part of the squad. So, um, But, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's, it was a dream come true to play from my hometown club in the Premiership, and that's one thing Kieran never got the chance to do, and I'm, I'm sure that's... Not a regret because obviously he had a fantastic career, but something he would have liked to have done. Yeah. Of course, the following season, you know, we, we qualified for the UEFA Cup. That must have been a, a great experience. Once again, you're still young, you know, young lad, and you know, playing in, in you know Europe. Your first appearance in Europe was uh, you scored. <laughs> that must have been uh, great for yourself. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the funny thing was obviously over the season, obviously finished fifth and everything. We missed out. Did we miss out by a point or on goal yeah, difference yeah, to, like that, yeah. to Liverpool? And it's like we. Uh, we were kind of, it's, it's crazy to sound, we were disappointed not to get Champions League um, over the season and that's kind of a big, a big, uh, a big thing for us that we were, obviously got promoted and, and, and missed out just by Champions League and to be disappointed by that is, was, was an incredible first season. Um, but yeah, second season to be, to be playing in Europe was again something that you can only dream of and Playing against some some good teams in in Europe was was, was yeah, another fantastic thing I did. Yeah, you know, so you scored and then you know we got through the rounds and we then ended up drawn against Inter Milan in the next next round. Uh, you know the first game, you know Alan Armstrong scoring the goal. What's your memories from that night beating the Italian giants in Inter Milan? Yeah, just the fact that like I said, someone Italian giant in a band against smaller Lipsch town, yeah. it was 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 crazy. Um, and then when Alan scored the header, it's like, wow, this is this is crazy, crazy. And we just kind of think we've got a chance going into the second leg. Um, yeah, we all know what happened there. <laughs> but you know, what's what's your you know memories from going going to Inter Milan? Of course, some of their you know big players, Anetti, Sidolf, you know, Ronaldo came off the bench. Uh, what was it yeah. like? You know, of course, you you know you're used to now playing against some big players. You know, you're playing against the Arsenal, Man United, and stuff like that. So you know, you're used to playing against some big stars. But of course, this is different. This is on the European stage. You know, us. You know, we lost four one over yeah. there, but it's still you know a massive achievement for us to at least be winning in the first leg. Of course, I mean to even have a chance going into second leg of, of, of going progressing into the next round was was something. Um, and then you get to San Siro in such an iconic stadium. It's it's. It was it was it was a bit surreal, um, and obviously, like you said, yeah, they had some some top top players, and obviously, yeah, we scored a hat trick, yeah. and we then got beat four one. But like I said, we got people like that. You got Ronaldo, and these are they're, these are these players are the, the top top players of the world, world class players. Did you uh, did you take a, a player's shirt on one of those games? Yes, yeah, I got a Ronaldo shirt. Yeah. Um, it was yeah quite funny I mean I think Mike Holland told a story recently was we uh, obviously we took a lot of fans and um, after Ronaldo came on I think we, he came on quite late not quite late because he came back from injury yeah. and uh, I remember asking him when he came on like after the game can we can we swap shirts he was like yeah that's fine um, and then remember when the whistle full time whistle blew I kind of looked around and think oh, where, where is he and he was walking towards the tunnel so I thought 
oh God, what do I do here? Yeah. Because obviously we had 10,000 fans who I wanted to, to applaud and thanks for their, for their coming across to support us. But I then decided to run down the tunnel and yeah. make sure I got Ronaldo's shirt. So, um, yeah, so yeah. I, I managed to get that. Yeah, I think that would be one of your probably biggest regrets if you sort of let that go. I think, yeah, because, you know, you never know if you're going to be playing against Ronaldo again or not. Or, you know, it's just one of those. Definitely for your boyhood club to... Do you reckon he's got... Did you give him your shirt? Yeah, I gave him my shirt. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what he's done with it. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I gave him my shirt. It's kind of... A, that's, that's the thing you do. Yeah. Then, um, you know, that season, unfortunately, we, you know, we suffered relegation. Um, you know, the Liverpool game, of course, is a big standout game. But, you know, how are you feeling, you know, suffering relegation? Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that year, like I said, it was getting into Europe and, and not having the biggest of squads was kind of so you play and kind of midweek and and at the weekend every week so we had a quite a small squad um and obviously it, it took us toll because getting injuries and suspensions the the squad wasn't good able enough to cope with the, the, the amount of games and relegation was obviously very disappointing because obviously after the success of the first season to then get relegated the next season was was very very disappointing yeah. Then um, your next move, of course, was to Newcastle. Did you did you feel like you were going to have to move? You know, you've been playing in the Premier League the last two seasons. You know, you, of course, you probably didn't want to leave it, which, but did you feel like that was the time for you to, you wanted to stay in the Premier League? Was that your decision? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, having, having played two years in the Premiership, I think if you speak to any player, um, they want to play at the top for as, as long as possible. So um, I didn't really think anything about anything of it. Um, I had the summer off. Um, I kind of left my agent and the club to talk about what was going to happen. Um, and then when I came back from my, I was away in, on holiday in Mexico and I came back to a voicemail from my agent saying um, the club have accepted a bid from Newcastle so we kind of need to go up and talk to them. Yeah. So that's kind of what I did. So, I mean, I, said I, was, I was happy to stay at Ipswich because it's, again, it's my boyhood club but then I was equally happy to go to Newcastle to play for Sir Bobby in the Premiership again. Yeah. So let's bring up Sir Bobby, of course. You know, you can say many different words about him, you know, what what a man, but for you, you know, playing under him, that must have been, been an amazing experience. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I'm sure you spoke to plenty of people who got, yeah. can't speak highly enough of him. And the man, he was, he was such a good man manager. Um, everything about him was fantastic. And um, yeah, I, I can't speak highly enough of him. He's for. for just everything about him he was he was everything you dream of in a manager everything you want in a manager and if I do go into management um, that's one thing that I will take a lot of what he taught me as a player into my managerial career yeah. um, of course you then I think your debut was in the Champions League so you're now playing the Champions League I think I've got it up here you went to I think Bosnia to play that game yeah you know, we you, did yeah can you remember that you know, I think yeah, you won 1-0 uh, playing yeah. the Champions League now as well yeah, so again, that was, that was enough. Uh, but the, the thing was, obviously, thankfully, I, I'd, I'd experienced playing in Europe with, with Ipswich, so to go and play, it was a Champions League qualifier. Um, so for my first game to be a Champions League, League qualifier, so I've obviously experienced European football and, and how hostile some of the European clubs can be. So it wasn't um, a major, major shock. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a, a next step up. Yeah. Of course, you know, you're reuniting with Kieran, you know, that must have been great to, you know, be playing alongside your friend again at Newcastle. And of course, Newcastle have got such a big club as well. Did you, you feel it was, it must have been great or well, you know, dream come true now playing with your, you know, good mate and playing for a big club like Newcastle? Yeah, so obviously, that obviously going, going to a massive club like Newcastle from a club like Ipswich is, is tough enough as it is, but thankfully I had Kieran there, um, to help me settle in um, not just Kieran uh, there was lots of um, players similar to early 20s that um, made me feel a real part of the squad not to say that the older players didn't make me feel part of the squad but there was lots of players early 20s so kind of had similar interests and um, could kind of mix with them settle in pretty, pretty, pretty quick How was it to, to move up to Newcastle of course Newcastle is known for its nightlife but for you you know you're probably the first time you may be away from home, you know, come, come to Newcastle and living up there. How was how was that at first? Or was that easy because Kieran's about and, you know, some other young lads can sort of help you and stuff? 
Yeah, but obviously you know what what young lads are like, and yeah. they like to to kind of party. And like you yeah. said, Newcastle was a, a city famed for for that that part of it. So um, we kind of probably enjoyed my life too much. Yeah. Um, but that's that's one of one of my regrets. Obviously, is is not getting the balance right of of football and um, enjoying myself. And listen, I'm not. I'm going to be the first to admit that. Yeah, I, obviously, I probably did enjoy myself too much and, and um, didn't concentrate as much as I should have on football. But to, to be fair, though, you, you know, yourself, you're still playing week in, week out in, in the Premier League and, you know, you're young, young lads. So for me, I would, you know, of course, maybe not too much, but, you know, you're still playing. You know, you, of course, at Newcastle, you finished third, then you finished fifth as well. You know, what was, what was that down to success because of the players you had? You know, Alan Shearer and some other top players. Yeah, again, I think that was that was we had a because of Sir Bobby, we had a fantastic team for it. Um, so, like I said we we were competing with the likes of Man, your Man United, your Arsenal's for for the league, and and that's we we had. I mean, obviously, Alan was a top top player. We had Gary Speed, we had Kieran, we had um, Craig Bellamy, who were, were were good good players. But compared to the likes of of the Man United and your Arsenal's, we. We were kind of punching a little bit above our, above our weight, but because of Sir Bobby and the team spirit he, spirit he created, we we believed that we could do anything. And you know, Bobby then left, and then Graham Sunez came in. What's your memories of Graham Sunez? Of course, you know the hard man himself, and you know he's a great player himself as well. But you know, what's your first interactions with him? Yeah, I mean, I, I like Graham Sunez. I think he, as as he gets a lot of stick or whatever, but he was an honest manager, and as a player, all you want is honesty. So. Um, if you weren't going to be in a team, he'd tell you why you weren't in the team and what you needed to do to, to get back in the team. So, as a player, that was that was what you need. I mean, yeah, he was he was a hard man, and but like I said, he he, he spoke to you as a as an adult and respected you and, and told you what's what and what's right from wrong. Yeah. Then, um, of course, Darren Ambrose then joined you as well. Another Ipswich Town link. He he, I think joined the season before. That must have been great for him as well to have another two Ipswich lads in there. How how good was Darren? Yeah, um, yeah. Like I said, I mean, when you when you get to such a big club like Newcastle, it's it's always good to see familiar faces. And when I, when Darren came, like I said, he, with myself and Kieran were there, so it might have helped him settle in a little bit. Um, and I think if you speak to to Darren, I think he'll be the first to admit he didn't do as well as he did at Newcastle that we all expected. Um, so yeah, Darren's a fantastic player, and when I when he came, I was really excited by his arrival, but. Like I said, I mean, if you speak to me, he'll be able to trust me that he did as well as, as he thought he would at, New, at Newcastle. Well, sure, you know, mem- what, what sort of games stick out for you when you're at Newcastle? Any games that stick out for you that go, oh, yeah, I love that game and stuff like that? Of course, Glenn Roder came in as well, but, you know. Yeah, um, again, listen, playing Champions League football is just the best club competition in the world, mm-hmm. so you're playing against your Barcelona and there's Bayern Munich you're playing against the top teams um, top top teams that go to the next level from from the UEFA Cup so we, again playing in the Milan at San Siro was something I was playing against Juventus um, but one year we uh, played Chelsea last game of the season and um, I scored a bicycle kick to <laughs> get us into a, at the time it was the Intertoto Cup so that was uh, one of one of the best memories at Newcastle mm. Then, uh, then you're you're on the move again. This time to Wigan. Did you do you feel that was your sort of time? Sort of up, you know. Of course, Glenn Roder was coming in as the manager. Um, what was your interactions with him like? Yeah, Glenn, Glenn, again, Glenn, Glenn Roder was a good. He was he was a, a people's person. Um, maybe the job at Newcastle was too big for him at the time because obviously he, he had um, he had problems. He had brain brain problems, and um, so coming to uh, such a big club like Newcastle was was maybe not the right thing to do at the time but and that's football and it's hard to turn Newcastle down but I was at a contract so I kind of knew um, before Glenn came in that I wasn't going to um, get another contract so it was a case of playing out the season then in the summer seeing what's what and uh, evaluating my options and, and then choosing the right one yeah. So was was Wigan one of the your first choices or there a few other clubs sort of interested? Uh, there was a few clubs interested um <laughs> I spoke to Harry Redknapp at Portsmouth uh, okay. a few times and um, was interested in going to Portsmouth. I went away to New York and kind of thought about going to Portsmouth and then when I came back from New York, 
uh, my agent called and said, look, um, we're going to be interested. Um, I said, okay, but I want to go to Portsmouth. He said, okay, that's fine, but let's go and talk to Wigan. So I went up to the, the Belfry um, and met with Chris Hutchins and we had a walk and we had a talk and um, he kind of sold the club to me and, and kind of said, look, we, we're going to kind of build a team around you and um, you're going to be playing week in, week out. And as a player, that's what you want to hear because obviously my time at Newcastle was up and down and in the team, out of the team. And I just kind of needed to hear that to, to rebuild my career and rebuild my confidence. And at Portsmouth, Harry didn't really say I was going to be starting week in, week out. So it was to hear that was, was why I chose to go Wigan. Yeah. And I have another former team out of yours, Marcus Bent was there as well. I caught up with Marcus um, about a week ago and, you know, he said, you know, you two had a good friendship. You know, he, you know, he said that you helped him a lot when he went to Ipswich because, you know, he didn't know many people, but yeah. um, it must have been good to see a familiar face here. Or did you know anybody else at Wigan when you first went? Um, I knew Chris Kirkland from the, from the England setup. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I kind of, it was, yeah, I knew him from the England setup. So he was, Probably the only familiar face that I knew. I knew Emma Heskey from um, a couple of times. Uh, I'd been away and, and we were in the same hotel, so I also knew him. But apart from that, it was kind of um, yeah, started afresh. And yeah, Bentley Cullen was was again um, a familiar face who who knew the area. He, he obviously lived in Manchester previously, so knew the areas. And yeah, we uh, well, we see it's good to see familiar faces. Yeah. And then, you know, Chris, of course, got sacked and then Steve Bruce came in. You know, this wasn't the first time you're going to, you know, sort of have Steve under you as a manager. We'll go on to that in a minute. But, you know, what's your first memories of Steve Bruce? Of course, a, a great player himself and, you know, coming into Wigan. What, what's, uh, what's your thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, he was, he was again, really good for my career. Um, he reminded me a lot like Sir, Sir Bobby. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a great man manager. Um knew exactly what players wanted and knew that no player was the same so he wouldn't treat all players the same so and obviously the experience he had as playing for the biggest club one of the biggest clubs in the world for so long it would be silly not to listen to take his advice and especially being a top top centre half like him it was it was it was great for for a kind of rebuild of my career you know of course you know Wigan at that stage there were you know you were finishing a decent you know positions I think you know when Steve his first full season came in you know you finished 11th then um, he then went off to um, go to Sunderland um, and then Roberto Martinez came in you know you were player of the year in 2008-09 season you know what was the you know story behind you know playing so well that season did you feel like you were now feeling good you know and settled I think that I mean even the year before I'm just, mm-hmm. the, the year you mentioned about when we finished eleventh, yeah. we were we we were um, around seventh and eighth for, for most of the season, and obviously because we're at Wigan at the time, Wigan were just a club that should be surviving relegation. So when we did get to kind of the magical forty point forty one points, we kind of took off off the pedal because we, we thought okay we're safe now and and we don't need to to do anything else that, because that was the club mentality and um, the fans that's all the fans expected so we got to 41 points we kind of down tools a little bit and we kind of went on a real bad run so yeah we, we probably could have finished obviously higher than 11 had we got had more belief and threw out the squad um, but like you said I mean Steve went on to to Sunderland and Roberto Martinez came in who again was a fantastic manager um, his attention to detail and love of the game love of football is, was incredible then, um, of course, you reunited with Steve at Sunderland's. You know, was that something that you felt like was going to happen? Did you feel like your time at Wigan was up and you felt like you wanted a fresh challenge? And, of course, now joining Sunderland, the rival of Newcastle, did you get any stick from that, from fans, you know, when you that first move? Or did you feel like it was a bit different move in terms of, you know, you're moving to Sunderland from a different club, not like Newcastle, Sunderland? Yeah, for me, it's like, so, obviously, it's, it's well known that Wigan are kind of a, a smaller club. They're, they're a rugby town and... <laughs> They kind of got crowds of, I don't know, between twelve and, and eighteen thousand on a, on, a, on a good day. So it's not really known as a football and football in town. So having been at Ipswich and then been to Newcastle, where you're playing in front of big big crowds, it's kind of something as a player you want to do. So um, once uh, some of them were interested, I kind of thought, okay, yeah, I've done I've done three good years at Wigan and. Um, I'm enjoying myself. I enjoy living in Cheshire. Um, 
but I kind of thought I'd miss playing in front of the big crowds and um, that little bit more pressure of 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 expecting fans expecting you to win games and and do more. So that was the reason behind kind of my move back up to Sunderland. Um, obviously, like you said, it's, it's going to arrivals, but I didn't see it like that because it's like, well, this is this is a football decision and uh, yeah, I'm going to play in front of a big crowd and. I was thinking, like, with my performances, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll get the crowd on side. Yeah. I'm name checking another former Ipswich player. It sort of just links up in a way. Of course, Darren Darren Bent was there. You know, that must have been great for you. You know, you must have... Um, of course, he was just breaking through in your final season, but that must have been great for you as well. Another familiar face and, you know, a person you may probably have spoken to a few times what, during your careers. Yeah, like I said, I mean, like, any time you see a familiar face, it's, it, it helps you settle in. So... To go up there and, and see Benny was 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 great. Um, obviously, helped me. I, I knew the area, but um, didn't know the club as much. So yeah, going there and, and and link up with Benny again was was great because, like I said, it's, it's, it's easy to settle in. Um, so yeah, um, I want to bring up a bad thing um, against you know against Newcastle in your return. I think to um, Newcastle with Sunderland uh, the the derby when you got sent off a five one defeat. You know. Oh. Not not a great game. What's your memories from that? You you know you're probably trying to forget about it, but can you remember anything from that? Yeah, I mean it's funny because as soon as I signed for Sunderland, all the fans kept talking about which wanted to beat Newcastle, and and if if they'd, they'd happily beat Newcastle and, and then get relegated, and it's like that's this is obviously it's, it's a game of football, and as players you you think it's, it's it's just three points at stake, but to the fans it's so much more. So um, at the time we were above them in the league. Um, and um, so, so, I mean, we were confident enough, but there was a lot of because obviously the fans put a lot of pressure on on, on some players, and and it, it kind of got to some players. And yeah, listen, to get sent off was it's not good at the best of times, but to get sent off, we were we were three 0 down and getting a red card, and and I just remember fifty thousand fans were so happy to see me getting sent off, and it was it was it was a very very low point in my career. Yeah. And you know, you, I want to bring up another player. You know, Jordan Henderson. I think you know you played with him for one season. He's gone on to do some great things at Liverpool and hopefully you know, lift the Premier League, you know, title when this all gets sorted. But you know, how good was he as a young young lad at Sunderland? Yeah, you could always see. I mean, you know, say a lot. You could you could see Jordan had had ability. Um, but what stands Jordan? What what sends him apart from certain players is it was his mindset. He was his work rate and, and mindset was fantastic, and it's uh, he obviously had the he had he had the ability to match. And because a lot of the time that season he played, he was playing right midfield um, because we had some good centre midfielders. So he'd play right midfield, and he wouldn't he wouldn't argue or wouldn't he'll just get down, get his head down, and, and play there and, and do well. So he always had the ability and the mindset, and it's it's no surprise that that he's doing as well as he is now. Then um, the next season, uh, Steve Bruce then got sacked. I think he got sacked. And then Martin O'Neill came in. Uh, how how good was Martin O'Neill? Of course, he's well known as well. But what was your reaction when Steve got when Steve left? Yeah, disappointed when when Steve obviously got sacked because um, I got on very well with him. Um, Martin came in, and it's in football. It happens all the time. When football managers get sacked. So as, as players, you kind of get used to it. And new manager come, comes in. He's got different ways, but. Um, I was, I was a bit disappointed in Martin O'Neill, um, mm-hmm. just for the fact that he was he wasn't really a people's person. Mm-hmm. Um, he was obviously under Brian Clough, and he believed that if he spoke to the players too much, then they'd get bored of his voice. So at important times, they wouldn't listen to what he had to say. So um, for me, having played under the managers I played under, I got on very well with their managers. So it, I was kind of close and spoke to them a lot. So it was a bit. A bit different, um, but also, um, I think he had uh, three or four years out of the game, and obviously the game had evolved from when he last got success at Leicester. Um, so um, I think he, he he struggled a bit, and I think he lost his uh, his right hand man. John Robertson didn't come in as a coach, and, and I think he was a big factor um, in helping him with such successful teams. Yeah. I'm sorry to bring up another Itchers player who um, joined up with you, Connor Wickham. Um, you know, of course, you never played with him and stuff like that. But 
you know, of course, Connor joining Sunderland for big money. You know, he's still a young lad. He burst on the scene at Ipswich Town. Did you know much about him? Um, yeah, obviously at the time, because obviously when I was all, all through my career, I still spoke to people at Ipswich mm-hmm. and, and they were raving at big 60 year making his debut. And um, obviously a few years later, came to Sunderland and we were, we had some, we had some good players. So again, um, I think at the time Connor was kind of brought as 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 a squad player because we had some we had some good strikers at the time. So again, I don't think he he hit the ground running and um, kind of struggled a bit up, up at Sunderland. Yeah. Then uh, Palio De Canio came in. He replaced Martin O'Neill, and once again, he's well known De Canio. But what's your what was your experience with him? Uh, he was he was I, did, I, I was into it a lot of the time, um, yeah. so I didn't. I didn't play that many games with him, but um, he was very strict. So at the time, obviously being with lots of managers that were, were, were quite relaxed, he came in and, and kind of this is the way, this is everything he wanted. He, he was kind of letting us know that he was a boss, and um, I don't think that's how football is nowadays. I think you've got to kind of give players some ownership and. Um, because the game, again the game's evolved and he, he, he I think he did well at his, his, uh, well, he was at Swindon and, and done very well but he was coming to the Premiership and he was he was working with players that had been in the game for a long long time and I remember we when he won the first session he done was he done like a, a basic heading session I'm thinking he was he was there was me Wes Brown and John O'Shea at the time three centre halves and I'm thinking we we've all played played Champions League football yeah. and obviously them two have got many, many medals between them and, and you're teaching us just something so 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 simple that you teach like seven year olds is kind mm. of like this is the this is it's kind of him wanting to be the boss and, and, and let us all know that he is the boss. Yeah. Of course he didn't really last that long and you know at that point you left Sunderland, you know, from there you you know you think you're thirty two at that point. Where, where did you feel that your career was, you know, sort of heading? Did you have a few options? I think you went on to West Ham for a trial and stuff. But you know, what where did you? Where did you feel that you wanted to go from from there? Um, I mean, the, 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 the last like I said, the last season at Sunderland, I was I was injured a lot, and then mm. I'd, I'd come back play again, get injured again. So I kind of knew at the time my body was kind of not in a great way. Yeah. Um, just just nothing made it to just wear and tear, and um, being a big guy, and and that wasn't helping my knees and stuff so yeah I was I went and tried at West Ham I, I was there for for a month pre-season and um, but I was living in a hotel in London so I was like well if I'm, if I'm going to kind of just with them and why would I not go live at home and and, and, and so I thought right, I'm going to go back home I spoke to Mick McCarthy and he's like yeah great come and come come to the pub and train so um, I came back to a position and was training um but again, I was, I wasn't fully fit, and I mean, but Mick was a great manager. I loved training with him, and even when I started coaching, I loved being around him. And he was a, again a great man manager. Um, I think you speak to a lot of players, and no one will speak badly of him. He was, and we'd, we'd speak after a couple of days because he was desperate to get me to sign a contract, and I would love to sign the contract had I been, had I been fit. I could never get fit. I thought. If I could get a level of fitness mm-hmm. where I could train twice a week, I, I would have signed a contract. But I just kept breaking down, and, and the last thing I wanted to do was sign a contract and be in a treatment room for a season because it's it's very very frustrating. Yeah. Um, then you know, d- did you sort of then look at maybe coaching? And you know, that's when you went on to of course coach at Issues Town and you know uh, as the academy and stuff. Did you feel? That was your route you were gonna do when you know when you're still playing. Do you feel like yeah, when I when I pack up, I want to go into coaching? No, I mean I, I didn't again because I hadn't planned for retirement, so mm-hmm. I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Like you said, I was 32 years old, so I thought okay, I got I got, maybe got a couple more years, and, and within these couple of years, I'll decide what I want to do after football. So I remember um, I got I got injured in I think September, had the operation. Um, then after one of the operation, I kind of thought, right, I'm going to retire now because, like, yeah, I'm done. Um, but friends and family were telling me uh, you're too young to retire and blah, 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 blah. So I kind of thought, I kind of took their advice and, and then and then played the change some more and and um, I couldn't really again couldn't really get fit because you know, I kept getting little niggles. And I remember playing a game of Portman Road. Um, uh, 
just in I think it was January uh, 2014 and, and I was up against Murph and, and did send at the time then to a fly yeah. and I remember playing the practice game and then after that game I kind of thought yeah I'm done because I could I knew exactly what they were going to do but my body was just just couldn't do it I couldn't I couldn't live with them so um, I still joke with Vid today about he, he made me retire yeah. um, it's, just, it's, it's a running joke between the two of us he forced me into retirement so from January to kind of June, I kind of just enjoyed retirement, went on holidays and just looked back and, and just enjoyed not having to wake up and yeah. be here at this time and do yeah. that and do this. So it was kind of just yeah, a little bit of freedom, mm-hmm. um, not, not not in a bad way, but I, I mean, I said if I could still play nowadays, I would do because I love the game. But mm-hmm. it was it was freedom and, and kind of after a while, I kind of, a few months, just kind of like, okay, I'm bored now, what do I want to do? So I called Brian at the academy um, and said, look, Brian, um, I'm interested in, in just maybe going down the coaching route. Can I come and have a look how, how the academy works and stuff? He's like, yeah, great. So I went one Tuesday night. Um, yeah, and he said, right, just listen, this is your club as much as it is mine. And um, I walked around and spoke to some of the coaches and, yeah, kind of started my coaching from there. It, it was something I, I looked at and, and straight away thought, yeah, I like this and I'm gonna give this a go. Did you, did you always feel like you wanted to come back, like home, to like you know, to live back at home? You know, that's where all your family and probably your friends are as well. So, did you feel you had to, you wanted to come back where your roots are? Yeah, Ipswich is, Ipswich is always home, and, and um, yeah, so I was always, so I was always gonna come back here. So, um, so then I said to then get a chance to 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 the academy was 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 ideal, um, and I haven't looked back. Yeah. And I want to bring up, of course, you know, future stars with, you know, Simon Millen, you know, what's that experience been like going over to, you know, Africa and is that something you straight away wanted to jump on when Simon maybe told you about it? Um, well, I've always wanted to do some charity work, uh, as obviously as players were in very fortunate positions. Um, so, yeah, over kind of later on in my career, I kind of thought, yeah, I'd like to do some charity work. And then um, once I retired, I kind of wasn't sure I looked at quite a few charities to try and to try and go abroad and, and do some charity work but there was nothing really obviously security is a big thing and um, I'm a bit, little bit of a diva and I like uh, the hotel and stuff like that so um, when when Simon um, I spoke to Simon, obviously I sponsored the academy for years and um, so me and Simon became very friendly um, and then he mentioned about this project um, him going to Ghana and being involved in a project and um, I should come and have a look. So I thought, yeah, great, because it's a chance to, to go and do some charity work and, and do something I've wanted to do. So I I went to, to Ghana with him. Um, he went for a week and I stayed for a month because I thought uh, a week's not enough. Uh, so I want to go for a month and really experience it. So, um, yeah, going for a month was, was great and I really, really enjoyed my time there and... Um, even after a month, could see the difference I was making, and um, so yeah, I thought, okay, this is something I really want to get involved in. So um, obviously, the charity grew, and Simon became um, the charity director, and and it just grew, and it's going from strength to strength. So um, I said, I go, I go back. I'm there six, seven times a year, and him the same. And it's yeah, it's just going from strength to strength. It's growing, and we're impacting people's lives. So it's it's something I really enjoy. And, um, really love doing. Of course, you've been saying you've been doing a lot of cycling. Of course, you, you, you know, talk, you know, Simon's part of that. You know, cycling to Amsterdam and stuff like that, and different things. Do you enjoy, you enjoy cycling now? Did you always cycle when you're sort of in your plan days, or something that you sort of, you know, started doing more since you retired? Yeah, something I've only done when I when I retired. Um, mm. I obviously don't want to be one of these ex-footballers that gets really put on a lot of weight, yeah. gets really big. So, yeah. um, I used to go to the gym every day and, and cycle because because of my knees, I didn't want to do mm. running and training and do lots of running. So I started cycling at the gym and then, um, obviously uh, it was known, Simon asked the time about me, that I love, love and cycle. And he said, okay, well, we do this event every year. Um, we cycle to Amsterdam. I said, okay, great. I'll, um, I think this was like a February, March time. I said, great, I'll, I'll do it. When is it? He said, like, he said, June. So I'm like, oh God, I've got a couple of months to, to get a road bike and get outside and, and get some miles up. So, I did that and yeah, I really enjoyed being out on the bike in the countryside and yeah, so now I cycle outside as much as I can and we were 
we did a cycle with in Africa last year in mm-hmm. Ghana with um, the British High Commissioner in Ghana and um, to, to promote our charity as well as a couple of other charities in Ghana. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's something I really enjoy and, and it's a way I keep them fit. Yeah. And I just want to quickly bring up, you know, your little brief return to Stone Market Town. Did you feel like you wanted to just get back into playing a bit of football, you know, and of course coaching and stuff with them? Uh, I, well, I, I played veterans. As soon as I turned 35, a lot of my friends were playing veterans. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kieran was there, my brother was playing. Um, so I thought, okay, yeah, great, I'm 35 now, I'm going to play veterans because obviously I went to a couple of the games and I, I see how much fun they, them guys are having. So I, I joined the veterans team and the first season, I kind of thought, okay, this was this is quite easy. Oh, well, it was very easy, but yeah. it wasn't it wasn't too much too much um, strain on my knees. So I thought, okay, maybe I can play uh, a little bit higher. Um, and obviously, I had a few friends at, at Stone Market, so I went to I went to, to Stone Market and um, I'd done kind of a pre season. I'd done a few training sessions pre season, and then played the game. Um, we were. 3-1 up and then we end up losing 4-3 um, but I came off after 60 minutes because I kind of thought yeah this is probably a little bit too much um, my knees were, were really great and so I, I, yeah I just played the game and yeah that was that was probably a little bit too far so um, listen I enjoyed it it was, it was great um, it was great to see um um, I mean, there was like 500, 500 people there. So yeah. for a local game to see five hundred people, that was that's that's great, and it shows how good local football can be. Um, had some real good players with real good um, experience. So yeah, I really enjoyed it, and it's just a shame that my body don't play more games. But yeah, I'm still playing now. Still play for the veterans. Um, Kieran paid Carlos plays for our team as well now. So we we had a pretty decent team. Yeah. What's the so what's the future hold? For yourself, you know, of course, coaching. You said you one day maybe get into management. You know, what what's, what are you currently doing coaching wise? What um, age group at Idris Town are you at, at the moment? No, at the moment, I, at the moment, no, I'm not at the moment. Okay. Um, I left there in October um, just because there was a few things I didn't really agree with. So I thought rather than falling out with them because listen, they're, they're, a lot of them are my friends. I didn't want to fall out with them. I said, look, I'm going to step away mm-hmm. um, for for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, but that's not listen. That, that wasn't me closing the door. I'd, I'd never close the door in this town and, and going back there. So I still go there. I still talk to all the staff. I talk to um, a lot of the kids I coached, and um, I've done some work with um, the player care manager. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of yeah, still kind of do some work for them. Um, but I obviously want to get into coaching. Um, so I'd love to go back there and coach and. Um, I'm not sure what the future holds. I just, yeah, I love football. I want to be involved in the game. Will I be a manager? Who knows? I mean, I, I, I don't know if someone said come and manage this team. Well, I'll give it a, a, give it a go. But for now, it's it's yeah, try and be a coach and try and learn as much as I can from the coaching side. Yeah. Is there any players who have sort of you are sort of coaching a sort of come up to? To play for it just at the moment, or was that was that still they were still a bit older for your age group? Yeah, so when yeah when I was when I first started coaching, obviously um, Andre and Flynn were um, they were in the under sixteen, so they were obviously top end of the top end of the academy, and um, then obviously in the, in the first team. So um, the next one probably uh, Ben Morris, he's been involved with the first team. Uh, Corey Ndeba, mm-hmm. he's been involved with the first team. Jack Lancaster, mm-hmm. he's been involved with the first team. Brett McGovern, so that kind of era. So I've mm-hmm. kind of done some work with them um, when I've uh, when I've been coaching. So, but they again, I wouldn't take credit for them. It's just a few sessions and stuff like that. But um, the kids I first started coaching are now under sixteen. So it's going to be a couple more years before mm-hmm. a couple of my ones get into the first team. Mm-hmm. Well, Titus, I don't want to take too much of your time up, but uh, thank you for much, so much for chatting to me and uh, keep safe and uh, hope to speak to you again soon. Cheers, Ross. All right, have a good one. Top man. Thanks, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. From true crime to football, Brexit to football, for more great podcasts from Archon, head to audioboom.com slash channel slash Archon.
slash channel slash audio.